And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Black and White Media, the and the creators of the first volume in the Dark Histories series, known known as Corrupted Flesh, which will be for fifth edition, third edition of the of the world's most popular role playing game, quote unquote, and the storyteller format. The one and only Eric Andres. How you doing today, man? Or tonight? I'm I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm do, I'm doing good. I'm just wa I'm just waiting for things. I'm just waiting for winter to come because while winter is coming, may have been a me may have been a meme over the years. It's not a meme over here. It's a fact of life. Where are you at? Um, I'm in Min I'm in Minnesota. I'm uh, in Orlando, Florida. Yeah, I've I've um I've got but I've got my fair share of buddies in fl in Florida. Some of some of whom I torture by sharing them by sharing with them Florida man stories. Yeah, we got a we got a couple uh, Florida mans in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, of course, of course. Now that things that things reached full circle with the fact that Florida man now has his own comic. Oh, does he now? How long has that been out? Um, it's. I'm not. I'm not sure if it's out yet. Technically, it's getting crowdfunded on Indiegogo. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, and actually has some decent name behind it. Decent names behind it. Some of whom have worked. Some of whom have worked at DC in the past. Oh, cool. Oh, but I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what about it made it stick for you? Oh well, I mean, I got a little bit of a story for that, so. Um, I don't know exactly how I, old I was, probably somewhere between six and eight, somewhere around there. And I've got a significantly older brother, and he started playing second edition with his friends. Mm -hmm. And the artwork on the book, was just it was just so cool, I'd never seen anything like it. And um, I wanted to play real bad. And for the most part, he's like, ah, get out of here, like, you little, little brat brother, right? Mm. And um, so eventually me and him would play and we had a great time or whatever. But so immediately he's like, get out of here, man, you're too young. And so I kind of understand the concept, but not real well. And so I go to the playground and more or less I conduct a game there. It's more or less just playing pretend, you know, it's almost like LARPing. And uh, but I'm guiding them like here and there, you know, like mm -hmm. kind of put a little narrative spin on what's going. You know, we're like playing Peter Pan and. Know, I assigned someone to be Hook and someone to be Tinkerbell and you know someone to be Peter and then all all this stuff happens you know and I think um, retrospect not that I was you know having these thoughts back then but there was multiple things first of all it gave me power right these people were listening to me and um, as time would go on I became really deeply appreciative of people that were just willing to listen. Like, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when when you can have a good rapport with that person and then they're just willing to listen to you, to me, that's kind of intoxicating, you know. Um, you get to be present and then someone someone showing genuine interest in you. And, uh, you know, that's at the heart of a good conversation or a, a good game. And it shows a lot of respect that a group of people, that are gonna they're going to get together and sit down and listen to what someone else has to say, and then they can have, you know, reciprocal interactions and it be interactive. So, yeah. um, back to, to my story. So, I started running these games, and I just, I pretty much instantly fell in love. And anytime, like, I got a little snidbit about it, you know, I tell my friends and I had about it, I just talk about it all the time or whatever. And um, as time would go on, I would eventually run on my own, but frequently, like the way I lived and I didn't really have transport um, to go over to a friend's house, I was, you know, a latchkey kid. So um, I didn't have any time to play except when I was at school. So me and my friends would actually just sit in the back of the class and we'd play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would have them actually pick a finger off my hand instead of having dice because dice are noisy and we get caught with those. So, um, like, pretty much, I think, I think playing in class started 
probably around fifth grade, but revved up in middle school. And I did that all the way through high school, to be to be honest. And um, when I didn't have a friend like in class, half the time I would be uh, <clears throat> at that point. The third edition was out. I pretty much memorized the, most of the players' handbook by heart, and uh, I would just like end up working on my campaigns or making characters or whatever. And um, I was just kind of fanatical about narrative as a whole. And um, when I was in high school, um, my brother had gone into retail and he did well for himself as a, as a manager at a big chain or whatever. But um, I knew that wasn't for me. And I really, I needed something kind of what I felt was exciting. So I made a plan to get into film afterwards and I would go on and I went to Valencia College a film program and I graduated um, and I was playing D&D throughout all that time too mm -hmm. but uh, really the my, my creative process ended up revolving around like uh, scenes like like still image framed out scenes and I think that has to do with my my love of film and, and watching things like that mm -hmm. so um, I started to go into film and I was involved in a relationship with angel and um i knew we went through a rocky patch and i knew if i went away on this film shoot that i got a job on uh for eight weeks that we weren't going to make it and i decided not to do that i want to be i committed and uh we've been together more than 16 years now mm -hmm. um after that decision i still needed something exciting to do so i went to the fire department so i became a firefighter emt and for the uh, nine years before I ended up stepping down. Mm -hmm. My first son was born with special needs. He has a condition called septo-optic dysplasia. And I was taking him about three appointments a week while working 60 hours. And after three years, I just got burnt out. I needed to step down and, and take care of him. So while I was in the fire department, I was just so busy that I didn't run. I didn't have any time to. I didn't play D&D. I barely played video games. And um, so... I got out, I had free time again, and I wanted to create a campaign. I had been hyper-creative all through my youth, and uh, I would taken nine years off. So when I started writing again, there was just an explosion of content. Like, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't stop. Like, just non non-stop. And um, my favorite games from uh, second and third edition, it was Ravenloft. Mm -hmm. 2E and 3E Ravenloft. And uh, I was just wild about it. And... Um, I remember, I remember where I lost one of my D&D books. I was in seventh grade liberal arts class, and a uh, there was a girl in there that I thought was cute, and she was into, like, goth stuff, and she wanted to borrow the book, and it was uh, the main book for the original Strahd box set. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Haley, I know you got it somewhere. You give it back to me. <laughs> so we... Um, uh, so uh, that was my favorite. So mm -hmm. I had recently uh, read in quotes. I um I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I'm really dyslexic, so I can mm -hmm. read, but it just takes me a long time. So I love love audiobooks. And um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is like perfect. You know, I I love that story, inspired by by Ravenloft. Like you know, they even got I don't know about five E, but in three they got an area that's that's like kind of. Frankenstein or show whatever mm -hmm. and then I was like all right but I'm gonna rewrite everything I'm gonna make it my own and um, as I was rewriting it uh, it wasn't working so but there's some fundamental differences in the setting between Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Ravenloft mm -hmm. predominantly that Ravenloft is a, a dark a gloomy aesthetic over the whole world right so mm -hmm. you got your, your big bad and he's a you know dark gloomy guy and then you got uh, a bunch of dark gloomy minions and you got a bunch of dark gloomy peasants uh, more or less and um and mary shelley's frankenstein the world's actually very bright and it's kind of romantic and idealistic in in large part and then there's these two really dark characters moving about in this world causing a lot of destruction in their behavior and one thing that's really interesting about those those uh, Frankenstein and the monster is they both have deep-seated human motivations for doing what they're doing. So you can empathize with this uh, either character, if you want to look at either one as an antagonist, despite the fact that they've done terrible, terrible things. And it's not that you justify their bad behavior, but it's like, oh, my, I, I feel where you're coming from, even if I can't get down on that, you know? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, that's how that's how I wanted to write my my villains was was like that. So I wanted you know if it's uh, to me what gothic horror is more than any kind of visual overlay, um, though you can you can apply one um, is it's an intermingling of romance and and terror you know like real horror mm -hmm. and when i say romance like that might be like and you know what we say in a romantic sense you know coupling that sort of thing but um when i say it i mean in a broader sense including that that can be in it for sure but it's like having high-minded ideals or or thinking the world's a bright beautiful place and that being juxtaposed to horror elements i think makes for a fantastic um genre of story because there's so much contrast going on there so um and also in uh frankenstein there's this this issue of the modern man and invention and um moving towards you know frankenstein technology and um you know prometheus he brings in the original mythology, Prometheus brings fire to man, but ultimately what happens to Prometheus is that he's eternally tortured. And Mary Shelley's book is The Modern Prometheus, or Frankenstein is the original title of the book. It's, you know, there's a good reason for doing these things, but it could, it could be the end, right? And it's technological, and that can be applied to many things. Um, you know, be it the atomic bomb, right? The atomic bomb is either the solution of all, to all our problems, or it destroys us all like it, it there's a, a fine line you know and with recent events in the world there's other things that are coming up it's like you know is this technology being used right and is it um is it it could it be the destruction of all of us and i think that it, it, it could be and that's why it's a it's an interesting story to explore so in corrupted flesh i've got a frankenstein like figure and he's tortured and he's got these reasons for doing exactly what he's doing and he, um, he's trying to, to cure death. He doesn't want people to die anymore because he doesn't, he doesn't want others to have to suffer through that. And he mm -hmm. has his own reasons for it, which will be revealed in the game. And so um, he keeps trying multiple iterations rather than one process. And each time he makes a new and terrifying monster, but mm -hmm. he doesn't really have time to deal with it because he's got his own baggage and he's trying to, to fix his baggage. So... The underlying theme throughout a lot of the adventures is that the the road to hell is paved with good intentions and i think that that is uh part of what makes both the doctor or the monster and mary shelley's story kind of, of interesting is they start off with really good intentions and you know, when when that goes awry you you're able to kind of follow them on that journey mm -hmm. now the corrupted hit the corrupted history Sorry, corrupted flesh. Um, it's the, pro the problem when I end, end up having to end up having to juggle two names at once. Um, corrupted flesh and the and just this whole j thing in general is strongly rooted in gothic horror, as we've dis as you've discussed. Hmm. What was your introduction to the concept of gothic horror? Was it was was it was it old renditions of Frankenstein, or were, was there a different path? Well. No. So I'll, I'll give you my input on it. So, and uh, I think it kind of depends on what you define as gothic horror. Some people would, I think, define it very narrowly and others broad. So um, one thing that stands out to me is Hellraiser. I think the first Hellraiser movie and the story, The Hellbound Heart, mm -hmm. be classified as, as gothic horror. And that's because of this intermingling of like... Uh, romance and sex and they're playing in that space and the dangers of it um so but i watched a ton of movies i watched a lot of tv as a kid and um I just i remember growing up and i don't know if things are, are any different now uh can you hear me oh i i can hear you I didn't know if my my computer cut out there for a second i'm sorry so i watched a ton of movies and they just showed a ton of movies on tv so I saw, you know, different versions of Dracula, and I saw, you know, different versions of Frankenstein um, and Hell, Hellraiser on TV. And um, they, uh, I think I would imagine my first experience would be to, to film adaptations of gothic horror uh, stories. Mm -hmm. Always, I, I like horror as a genre, and so I think the and I like moody stuff uh, within horror and outside of it. So, you know, those two kind of team up. 
Frankenstein really stood out for me. Um, any story where there's a monster and the monster's trying to find its humanity, I think is fascinating. And I think, um, you know, for, for me personally, I, it's that sometimes in life we kind of, we paint ourselves in a picture and a light and it's not always flattering. And I think I've done that to myself, but I have really good intentions and I want to, I want to do good things in the world and I want to be someone that people can look up to. And I've always kind of searched and it's been a struggle. And so that notion of the, the monster that just wants to do good and wants to be human is, is really fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, even uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a story is very different when, whenever it's portrayed on TV. But one thing that they usually do is paint the monster as someone to be sympathetic towards. Like, oh man, you, you know, you're doomed from the start, but that doesn't, you know, there's there's some humanity in you, you know, like there's there's something there. So it um, I think I really like I really like that. And if uh, anyone's looking for that kind of story about that monster finding themselves or trying to on to humanity or find it um mm -hmm. alan moore's swamp thing is is a pretty amazing run of that he does some really wild and interesting stuff in in, in that mm -hmm. um, it it comes up here and there but uh quasimodo is another one victor hugo's hunchback of notre dame uh, yeah that's a little bit more of a dense read but it is a bit of a dent it is a bit of a dense read and it has a um it has it has a very european ending to which, to, by which I mean, rocks fall, everybody dies. <laughs> um, <laughs> which spoiler is, alert. is um, two hundred and fifty year spoiler alert. Um, I think, I think when, I think when there's that, I usually have a, I usually have a rule that the statute of spoiler limitations is, um, is what is one to five years. Um, one to five hundred. Look, one, look. Once you get into the once you get into the centuries difference, I think I think the statute is passed. <laughs> All right. Well, some of the, some of the viewers out there only ever saw the Disney version, so they got a different. Oh, I ending. oh I know, and some and some of the people who, I um, I I've I've done a few I've done a few bits of villainy in the sense in the sense that I had I had friends who. Real, who really loved the Disney version that I told them if and I told them if you really if you really like that you should you should read the you should read the book <laughs> and I told them absolutely nothing about what's in the book and it's and they didn't video, man. if they get a problem with it that's their problem <laughs> um I I and I've done I I've I joked I joked once about the about when there was a question of how to ruin a fairy tale in one sentence or less, and I just said everyone dies in the German version. <laughs> I don't know. I guess if you're ruining it, it's in spoiler alert. Yeah, I guess that's about right. Well, in in the in the case of ruining people's idea idea of what they consider fair what they consider fairy tales, the happily ever after stuff. You look at you look at a lot of the source materials for what people consider fairy tales in in the in um the zeitgeist. They do not exactly have happy endings, especially the ones that come out of Eastern Europe. So it, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I agree with that, um, that assessment. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, back to the game for a mm -hmm. second. I think that I really like about um, Gothic horror is that because there's such a contrast between like the setting and the event, or like. Mm -hmm that light and dark contrast it feels like anything could happen at any moment and mm -hmm. so when it comes to an ending i don't know if it's just gonna go sideways last second i think that and that that helps with a horror story right because it maintains suspense throughout it i will admit that i have a sem that i've always had a semi-broad a, a um take when it comes to gothic horror and there's there's a few there's a few there's a few entries that i that i consider gothic horror or gothic horror adjacent that I would that I would be I would be curious to see if to see if um if they if they could be drawn they could be drawn upon to integrate into uh into the into this dark histories um series that you're developing um 
I'll go with the I'll go with the other major heavy hitter since we've made a lot of allusions to Frankenstein tonight, and that being Dracula. Um. So there's. Uh, yeah, I you could definitely do a, a Dracula rip. Um, so here's what I would recommend when so a lot of D and D and campaigns are taking classic good stories and then adapting them, right? Mm-hmm. And it's I think when you're doing that, um, you can take the time to take a step back and go, what works about the story? Why is the story good? Why is it important? Why is it stuck around? You can start identifying the key elements along go to rip it off Mm -hmm. you rather than rip off the plot directly you can go back to those key elements um oh sure sure Mm -hmm. you can you can do that a couple different ways you know um with with dracula i um there's if if the kickstarter does well and we end up getting to the the stretch goals i have i've got a a vampire tucked away in in one of the uh Mm -hmm. the potential bonus adventures but yeah it, it could um I think that that uh, just about anything could be adapted. Um, I mean, I'm more than happy to to hear your other ones. I think with with a Dracula tale, you know, you just have a guy who's got a, a big heart, and he uh, it is he's got a someone who he loves, and that person goes, and then after that, like their their love is so so passionate that. Uh, it transcends death. I mm-hmm. think that's like a very romantic thing, and anyone would like that. So yeah. uh, you, that's that's how you would, I think, tell a, a Dracula story. You know that mm-hmm. this person's got to to resolve that that love, and it's it's gone bad. The milk's gone sour as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if we could take a sidebar just for a second. One thing that I found really interesting is uh, I was listening to a lecture about um, modern media and Dracula came up and I think it was like an Oxford professor talking and he was talking about how um, Dracula is the ultimate bad boy but he symbolizes as the degenerate in society stealing other men's women but that was uh, a pretty interesting take mm-hmm. in, the, in the story he comes at night and the the women are attracted to him and then ultimately end up going off with him and it's the hyper noble men that work together within society that that work to team up and and go against dracula mm-hmm. so i thought that was i thought that was really really interesting yeah. he was a little bit derogatory the oxford guy was a little bit derogatory i thought it was a bit excessive i thought that, that that's an interesting interesting thing and yeah people can be insecure but that's that's a pattern that's a real pattern in reality too which mm-hmm. might be the reason the story stuck around um i do think i um when it comes, when it comes to Dr- when it comes to Dracula, the t- the times that I've the times that I've used Dracula or an e- or an XP, um, I've t- I tended I tended to lean more towards the concept of um, lost faith. Um, some someone who someone who had someone who had faith either it either in a either in a person or an in, or an institution, since there has been some takes where he where he um, fought in the Crusades. But ended up losing, ended up losing his faith. Um, but I, fi- but I find that I find that take that taking taking that taking that approach is an is an interesting an interesting way to to spin the to still have the tragedy of um Dra- of Dracula just in just in a just in a different manner. Um, mm-hmm. But the next the next instance that I that I wanted to go with is um. Debatably gothic horror, but it, but like I said, I consider it adjacent, just close. Go for it. And that that is the Phantom of the Opera. Mm, I I mean I would personally I wouldn't even put it adjacent uh, by my own personal metrics. I would say that that falls into the category. It's it's got a, the dark gloomy overlay on it, and you know it's got a tragic figure. Mm-hmm. So, oh, um, yeah, I would I would put it put that in, in the genre. Yeah, I've it's I've seen I've seen arguments that can that can go e- that go either way on it, which is why I which is why as a net I said I said adjacent. Um, the last one, which is which might definitely be stretching things on this matter, is Jack the Ripper. 
Well, um, not all. Not only I think that that makes because in Jack the Ripper you get that that uh, kind of cloaks and 1800s feel. I I would say that um, it's pretty pretty good. I mean, actually, for one of the not uh, corrupted flesh, but one of the other outlined um, campaigns, there's a there's a Jack the Ripper character already in there. So mm-hmm. I would say that that it works. Yeah, because Jack the Ripper was rom- what is one of the earliest examples of ro- of romanticizing the, a, for lack of a serial killer essentially, um, mm-hmm. especially especially given his per- his particular targets. Um, now, as I understand it, corrupted flesh is being made in three different editions. 5e, 3.5, and Storyteller. Um, with now, I want to f- I want to focus a bit a bit on the on the Storyteller format. Um, obviously, when I hear when I hear that, I immediately think of say Storyteller or Story Path from White Wolf slash Onyx Path, the system that's used to power the various versions of the World of Darkness or Chronicles of Darkness, and so and so on. Um, how similar or different would the storyteller format be to that? To that, or what? Or um, would, it, would it be not I, that I similar? Can't, to be honest with you, um, though I game a lot, I've usually uh, stayed in a relatively narrow band of, of games, and I've sat uh, in on on some of those games, and I've had discussions about the systems, but mm-hmm. I can't. I don't know enough about it to really comment. I. I don't think that it's going to be that similar to it. I would say more distinctly different than than similar. Um, I think that what, what the storyteller format is going to go for is I think that 5e and 3e have their, their strengths and their weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, the strengths that I like about uh, 3e, which is you know what I, I played mostly, mm-hmm. um, is that... Uh, functional complexity, like the game's really complex and versatile um, and you can do a lot within that space but you're also bounded by certain things of course it, you know if you work hard enough you can break break the game break the system but um, one thing that I, I like about that system is that the characters are do a lot with them but you're real still relatively narrowly focused um, I know druids kind of do it all, and clerics do a pretty good job of it too in 3e. But um, so with the characters' abilities being relatively narrow in their focus, mm-hmm. it makes the team have to work together. I feel like it it um, limitations frequently induce creativity, right? Because mm-hmm. you got to work around a problem, and I really like that within within 3e. And um, one of the strengths of 5e is there's a lower learning curve. Um, they with with that's less complex which pros and cons but the pro of it is that it, it's not as hard for people to get into and um you know it opened up the market 5e is humongous there's there's a lot more people playing D D now than than ever and i can't fault it like i mean I, it's not exactly my cup of tea but i like gruelingly hard games for the for the most part right and not everyone's into that so um, so back to the storyteller format, what I'm going to try and do is the whole game, Corrupted Flesh, tries to promote creativity, and it tries to give enough structure to, to do that and also give a lot of leeway and freedom. Mm-hmm. So I, I want it to be... The, the goal of the, the system is to have a relatively simplistic character creation process that still has enough um, variation for those that seek it to make their characters very customized. Mm-hmm. And then to have a combat system in which the um, game isn't bogged down. Because I think that's one thing about 3E is depending on the, the group, combat could take an incredibly long time. Um, and I don't see that as a strength or a weakness unless you try to scale it. Because mm-hmm. if you go scale... The market's not going to want 
want that. Sometimes I want a game when I'm playing. I want combat to be easy and going. And then other times it's like, well, we there's no room for errors because I want that that challenge. And oh, mm -hmm. um, I I I want the game to be about the the storytelling, and I don't want it to get bogged down by anything. So ease of play is really a, a big big focus on that. Mm -hmm. And um, so the mechanics are going to try to be very streamlined. And then when it comes to character creation, uh, custom ability is, is like the number one focus for me. Uh, though don't don't expect to to have um, be a superhero like in mm -hmm. traditional five E games. Oh yeah. So with that with that with that said, you're you're doing um you're doing th as I understand it, you're doing three books with this with this particular um, project. Um, so. Uh, uh, it's the the Dark Histories Volume One, mm -hmm. right? So this is the the first volume, and the first volume has three books to it. Mm -hmm. Each volume, each time I release a volume, be a campaign book and a campaign settings book. Mm -hmm. But uh, the information is distributed throughout the the three books. So there's a lot of rich characters, and even in the monsters and um, the the player character creation information. All there's all this world building information woven into it so this way if a player doesn't want to sit down and read 10 pages about the lure of the world as a general um they're going to pick it up because they're constantly going to be picking up little little pieces here and there that help paint the picture and that goes along with the the art in the game so each volume is going to be one campaign in one country but th they'll have multiple adventures within it mm -hmm. so um, the Dark Histories Volume 1 Corrupted Flesh takes place in the Grand Duchy of Strongburg and help the storyteller for when that, that hears that phrase when I say storyteller I really mean game master or DM but since I'm so narrative focused I really want to put that on there because I, I think that, that that helps think of it as the game as a story and something rich mm -hmm. in that sense narratively Yeah. so the help the storyteller the game's been broken up into three zones um, it's designed to be a sandbox style game. And the adventures are there's 14 adventures that are clustered together, divided by the the three zones. So this way, anytime the characters are in a specific zone, the storyteller has limited information to track. Mm -hmm. So, and and another thing that the storyteller is encouraged to do is to run multiple adventures at the same time, mm -hmm. and then take one player and put them at the center of the adventure. And then not disclose to the players the the starting place or stopping place of an adventure, so all of them merge together, and each player ultimately feels like they're pretty much the protagonist or the main character of the whole campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in, with that in mind, you talk you talked about um, when it comes to when it comes to what you mentioned about running multiple adventures like that. What I'm kind mm -hmm. of reminded of is the passion play format. Of multiple characters that's suggested in a game like Ars Magica, uh, but it sounds like you're going the reverse. Instead of people having multiple characters that 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 are actors in this in the story, you have you have multiple sto you have multiple stories overlapping on each other. That's yes, correct. So there's the out of the fourteen adventures, there's overlapping NPCs. So this way, it becomes easy for the the storyteller to inter interweave these uh, these bits, and also it creates uh, ease creating hooks for the adventures as well. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> the and the way that the the adventures are set up is relatively unique, I think. Um, now, when I say that, uh, I could be missing something. You know, you just referenced a game. I'm totally unfamiliar with the system. You give me enough context so I know what you're talking about. But So I'm doing a, a lot of things within the game that I hadn't seen otherwise. So when I present an adventure, the way I do it is I, there's an introduction which tells the storyteller kind of the gist to the heart of the adventure and where it's going to go in a, in a very broad sense. Then it has um, adventure triggers usually two or three different ways to pull a character into it giving mm -hmm. them options so even if, if it's at the start of the game or later in the game when they introduce this um different ways to get them in there it gives them options right mm -hmm. then after that there's a plot section which gives the exposition for the adventure and introduces the npcs mm -hmm. and that's going to kind of come to a, a head of sorts 
and that marks the introduction of the players into the scenario with these NPCs. And then from there, which is really the information that happens when the storyteller's playing, running a game, it's usually three to five benchmarks mm -hmm. to guide the players through. They're usually mysteries with a moral dilemma. And it's getting from point A to point B and letting the, care, the, the players explore the space and everything that's going on and just kind of gently guiding them. So really, you know, for the storyteller, when they're running a game for one adventure, they shouldn't have to memorize the gist of or reference more than 10, you know, 15 sentences, something like that. They don't, um, I think that when it can be distracting to the game, if the person running the game has to stop and, and read a paragraph to set everything up and then put the players back in. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, I played games like that. I've, 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 I've played high level games like that. And I've, I've played games that weren't run so well doing it and it, mm -hmm. it can work, but um, for me, it never it never really worked. It was it was always real clunky. Mm -hmm. So um, then, after these three to five benchmarks to kind of guide the care the players through the story, there's usually multiple endings. Usually, roughly three, um, mm -hmm. based off of which direction the players go within the moral dilemma. And all of this stuff um, usually has lasting consequences, but it's really encouraged for the storyteller to. Uh, run it however they want. You want the players to go off the rails, or you want to change what the moral dilemma is, or you know whatever. Um, it's your story, and you need to connect with your players. And then also another tool that's that's put into each adventure is the horror scale. Mm -hmm. And the horror scale, it it's pretty much going to allow the person running the game. It's going to give suggestions to them and how to tone down or rev up the horror elements. So you want a PG thirteen game, you got. A soft audience or a younger audience and you think that that's going to better connect with them or that's just where you're comfortable run a pg-13 game you know you want something you got you know big horror fans and they want it they want it terrible make make an nc-17 game and it'll have suggestions and and what areas you can lean into to to better connect with your audience mm -hmm. now speaking speaking of that i think i think that's a that's a perfect spot to segue into the other into one of the other major books in the in this trilogy, that being the protagonist handbook, which I'd say I'd say is going to be the um pri the prime um player facing end uh, end of the end of the scenario. Yes, so that's going to be pretty much everything that the players are going to interface with. Um, mm -hmm. If they're playing for five E or three, you know, there's the core books, um, but if you know, just on their end, and so the the storyteller guide and the protagonist handbook have different information in them um, mm -hmm. regarding both setting, but um, other things like game mechanics too. So most of a good amount of the spells are going to be have different information to help maintain suspense throughout the game. Mm -hmm. As an example, the spell create ally um, tells the player that they are going to summon a familiar face to aid them. What they don't know, which is this portion is now contained in the storyteller guide, is that the player performs a ritual and they create a duplicate of themselves. And that duplicate now joins the the, the party and they're an NPC and it's a very huge uh, gain to the party as resource-wise. And they appear to be just like the player. They're, mm -hmm. they're very similar, you know, and things are great and copacetic and they, they help the team out a lot. Then once the, the player gets to a moral dilemma and they choose to go one way or the other, then the dupl the double goes, oh, I can't stand for that, and then mm -hmm. goes a separate way. Or at least this is how it's suggested in the player's, uh, I'm sorry, the storyteller guide. Mm -hmm. And it, at that point, the storyteller can decide that, you know, I'm more or less getting rid of the spell, I'm writing this character out, or they can turn it into a reoccurring villain for the group. You know, and then that by it being a double of one of the players in the group, and by having them have a relationship with this double, it now becomes a villain created in the game that was designed by one of the players, and that's going to increase you know uh, player engagement. Like mm -hmm. they they created this whole sub arc within the game of having to deal with this double, and that's just off of one spell. The game really tries to put a lot of elements at play at any time that the storyteller could uh, really lean into this one thing and almost make a campaign out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, in the in the bullet points on the on the um, 
protagonist handbook. It brings up that there that there's five original five original classes within within it. I'd like to I'd like to go into a sampling of those classes and what they're going to be bringing to the table. Um, sh sure, and uh, don't let me forget to bring up the the character archetypes when, mm -hmm. af afterwards. So, um, the setting for corrupted flesh. Um, each country is going to be be different to give each campaign a, a different feel even though it's in a unified world mm -hmm. and corrupted flesh is more or less a georgian pre-victorian right before uh victorian era so it's like early 1800s and that's a little bit of a different feel than uh your traditional 5e setting so uh, there's been some some classes that reflect that mm -hmm. um there's going to be a, a pugilist class which mm -hmm. is going to be a modified monk um they're going to fight with their hands the setting is low lower fantasy than you would expect to see in your average D, &D game mm -hmm. and so the one thing that's really valuable about that is the person doesn't rely on on items to to get their job done you know they, they fight with their hands mm -hmm. and um then there's going to be a uh, real tough and, and grizzled kind of ranger type class called Berg Manor or Mountain Man or Mountain Folk, mm -hmm. where they uh, they specialize in using firearms and they're pretty much a survivalist. Um, in the the setting Strongberg, the the people are kind of inspired by Enlightenment values and society is very highly ordered. And every once in a while, there's someone who it's just not it's not working out. Staying in your cubicle and working all day just isn't isn't working for them, and they got to go off on the mountains and they got to be by themselves, and they're mm -hmm. usually pretty grizzled. So, yeah. um, you know, and that's a, a class that's like a perfect place to step in to exploit the fact that the world has guns. It, mm -hmm. it has you know black powder powder weapons. So, um, yeah. that's like a nice little flavor thing for for players, um, depending on if they're used to playing high fantasy. Mm -hmm. games though i think i think it's becoming more and more popular to, to introduce firearms <clears throat> um another one is there's going to be a specialist class where it's kind of like a rogue but they're actually really terrible at combat and uh their ability their skill-based abilities are further along than a, a rogue and their place within the group is that they they learn things and the adventures are mysteries and some of these monsters um, a lot of the monsters, it's a horror setting, so there has to be a big power differential between the monster and the player for the monster to be scary, right? So the players are going to have to either discover their, their weakness or figure out a real creative way to, to beat them. And that, um, that character is going to have an advantage in that in that way, though they're you know not going to be you know, a mob of, of uh, you know brutes by themselves or anything like that. Now, when it now since you brought it up, this would be an opportune time to talk about archetypes. And when when I end up hearing archetypes, when it, whenever there's a five E like discussion, the temptation is always there to that ar that archetypes are are going to be subclasses. Is that the case, or is that not, or is that not quite accurate? Um, the that's I would say that's not accurate. So. The archetypes uh, can kind of dictate a class, just because um, it's class, it's the person's skill set, and the archetypes help define the character by motivation, right? So if they're motivated to do something, that might that might make them, you know, pick a, a specific class because they're going to be way better at it. So, as an example, one of the the archetypes is the fanatical scientist. Mm -hmm. You know, archetypes are patterns that keep repeating over and over again. And even if the players don't know what an archetype is, they know this because they've seen it in, in depictions in their culture and media. So the fanatical scientist is this un, unbalanced individual mm -hmm. that, um, that really throws themselves at this one thing. And they're really exceptional about it. But they're, you know, like I said, fanatical. And they, they need someone else to around them that's going to keep them really grounded mm -hmm. and so they to to make sure they don't you know break loose with their their bearings or from their moorings like they gotta they gotta have that sidekick more or less to mm -hmm. to 
put a point in the right direction. So um, under the character archetypes, you know, you, there's a short introduction into like this kind of behavior. And then there's a, another short section that gives them examples. So for that character archetype, you know, it's Doc Brown from Back to the Future with Marty and it's Rick from it's Rick and Morty, um, you know, or uh, Dr. Otto von Lichtenbrook from Journey to the Center of the Earth. And I know it's it's not super popular, but it's it is one of the inspirations for Corrupted Flesh. Um, um, Rick Yancey's The Monstromologist series. Uh, the, the One of the main characters in that is pretty much bipolar. And if you look at these these characters, they're, they're all doing it kind of a different way. You know, Doc Brown's optimistic and um, a little absent-minded and a little weird. And uh, Rick is jaded. And, and um, uh, the other monstromologist, he just wants to, you know, be the, the smartest or, or whatever, but he's he's just all over the place emotionally. There's different ways to um, play these characters, and they can be very diverse, even though they have the same motivation. So it's um, just one way to help guide the player, and if they can preconceive their, their character during character creation, they'll be less likely to stop and go, what would my character do in this situation? They kind of already get this compass. Mm -hmm. uh, that also helps out during those moral dilemmas if the, the player wants to go hey i, I want to stay deep in character when i'm making this decision so this is it's just going to be one more tool for them to pick up and the character archetypes it's not a firm mechanic it's just something that the the player can decide to adopt or not during the character creation process mm -hmm. and each each archetype will have a pre-made character so because some players they're not really big on character creation mm -hmm. and so it will have a pre-made and characters can pick the pre-made as is or modify it or you know just go well i'm going to use the archetype but i really got these little couple things i want to throw in mm -hmm. and so i don't want to use the pre-made i want to do it this way and that's going to enhance like the more the, the player can make decisions the more ownership they're taking of the game and as long as that doesn't conflict with the storyteller like it's going to enhance engagement for both parties mm -hmm. now with now with that with that said the third um the third book in this in this trilogy is the encyclopedia monstrosica and would it be fair of me to say that this is primarily primarily a gm reference as well as a for lack of a better term monster manual so um if anybody paying attention might notice that there's these three books mirror that of Dungeons and Dragons core core books, right? You have your DM's guide, you get your your player's handbook, and you got your monster manual. These are companion books to to those uh, core book resources. If it's a five e or three e edition book, mm -hmm. but if it's a storyteller format, it'll have it's going to be longer in page length, and it's going to have uh, uh, its own original system nested in it. So it is the core books mm -hmm. if it's the original. A storyteller format and for the other two there'll be companion books to the core book set yeah and sent um since since you since you want to give a degree of detail to eat to each of them i'm guessing that um an individual entry will have the stat block have a description of it um as well as as well as some of its um tactics and behaviors that it prefers yes so um i i Real big on. Um, I think that combat and and storytelling, be it moving movies or TV or um, a book or you know a game like a tabletop RPG, the combat should help paint the picture of the world and it should enhance the story. So when making the the Encyclopedia Monstrosica, I really like to have a big focus on behavior of the enemy because I help. I think it. Um, is a perfect way to enhance whatever's going on narratively. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the creatures that that's been uh, released and shown is the last priestess, and it starts out and it gives her her background, and there's a stat block in there, and at the end there's behaviors, and so um, this is supposed to be kind of like a divine creature. It's a you know, seven foot tall woman that's that's made out of diamond, mm -hmm. and so. Um, 
pretty much impervious to attack, so it just moves slow and gracefully, and then it just physically rips people apart, limb mm -hmm. from limb. It you know, just really uh, brutalizes them. And it within the description, it describes that she, her tactic is that she just moves to the, the closest person, uh, so she doesn't really have to move fast, and then you know does what she does and dispatches them and moves on to the next. And uh, not until she's been hurt within... 10% uh, of her of her total life did she modify her behavior because most people don't have magical weapons and aren't going to be able to hurt her. So, mm -hmm. and at that point, once she realizes she can be hurt, that it's an abnormal scenario and then would would attack the perceived danger rather than just whoever's next to her and ignore whatever incoming damage is because she's got damage reduction and not going to have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And Oh, now what are you shooting for as far as a as far as a page count for each? Oh, it's um, it's really hard. Hey, there's so many factors that that swing that one way or the other. One of the factors being art, and the more the more the the game raises, the more art there's going to be. And I want this thing to be packed with with art. So that could really stretch out the page length. Um, oh. With and also the pages haven't necessarily been formatted yet, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things that could could influence it. I would imagine that the storyteller's guide and the protagonist handbooks are probably going to be over 200 pages. I would imagine they're going to be on average probably between two and 300 pages, and thankfully. Pedia Monstrosic is going to be a lo little bit lower than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will, I will certainly be looking forward to see, to seeing how it how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. I'm. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I'm just. I know that there's this game's going to be good. I just need to connect with, with my base. And I know there's people out there that are, they're going to be excited about it. I was recently at Spooky Empire, the horror convention. Mm -hmm. and anybody that was in the tabletops and was really stopped to listen to me, they were just, they were in it. And it was, it was amazing. I got to, you know, meet a bunch of strangers and make their eyes light up. Mm -hmm. I just need to, I need to get out there. I need to get seen. And I want to, I want to give people something special. And it's going to be, you know, rewarding for me. Mm -hmm. So, Thank, thank you for having me, because you're, you're helping me do that. And at any time you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to whether it's to discuss further on further on Gothic horror, or even more even more so the neo Gothic era the, uh, of the of the nineties, or or just to or just to laugh at the dice gods being merciless again, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you for having me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>